Welcome back to Razmaf Star TV. Today I am uh, I'm going to have back Guy, Dr. Guy Windsor. Hi, Guy. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm I'm fine. Thanks. Nice to see you. Uh, today we are going to have a very, very important topic because we are going to talk about an Italian manuscript, uh, uh, Fiore, Fiore de Liberi, right? And Guy, who is this person and what kind of manuscript are we dealing with? Maybe we start with the person who wrote this manuscript. Who was Fiore? Okay. Well, okay, just to give you an idea, I have this many books to help answer that question. Right. Um, okay, so sometime around 1340, maybe um, in the, the northeastern part of Italy, there was a boy who was born uh, to a knightly family, but was he? He never became a knight himself, but he was his father was a knight, and yeah. uh, his name was Fiore de Liberi, and he grew up sort of mad about weapons as he says himself in the introduction to his book and pursued a career in as effectively as a master at arms and he got various interesting jobs in the um got in the military world of the late 14th century italy i've actually i've written up a kind of summary of it in one of my books um let me just uh oh, i've got the wrong glasses on <laughs> okay, hang on so also there's a, there's a book by a chap called ken monshin called the knightly art of battle that kind of lays out most of what we know about fury's life um but he was i mean at one point he was commanding the artillery in the city of udine um, and he, he was sufficiently good at his job that he could legitimately claim as his student um, several of the best known knights of the period, including Galeazzo de Mantua, who was um, held up in at least one contemporary document as like the, the kind of the greatest knight of his time. As a kind of a, as a as an example as an example of like the flower of knighthood. So, Fiore's um, Fiore's career was basically as a professional military person training knights, and he dedicated his um, he, well, he wrote a book. Well, we would call it a book now, but they wouldn't have called it a book then. I don't think um, he wrote a treatise describing the entire art of arms as he saw it. So it's like a picture of the art of arms, uh, which is called Il Fiore de Battaglia, the flower of battle, which of course is a play on his own name, which is flower, Fiore. Okay, which, you know, it sounds to our modern ear, it sounds like a bit of an odd name to give a sort of really hard weapons dude. But no, <laughs> <laughs> his name was Fiore, flower. Uh, his name literally means flower of the free. And he dedicated his book to Niccolo d'Este, who was the Marquis of Ferrara. And um, we assume that the Marquis was glad of that. <laughs> um, we don't have any record of, of the Marquis himself responding to this. But there are, uh, obviously it was manuscript, so it's handwritten, hand-drawn. We can't say for certain which is the earliest copy but we generally believe that the Getty Manuscript, was not now called the Getty Manuscript because it's in the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, um, is the earliest from around 1400. There is another one which is incomplete from maybe a little bit later. Uh, there's only about maybe a third or half of the manuscript there. Um, I don't think the manuscript itself was ever finished. Um, then there is a probably slightly later one, which is actually dated in the text to the 10th of February, 1409, which is the 10th of February, 1410 by our modern reckoning. Because back then, um, the new year was um, at sort of around the spring equinox rather than um, at the end of December. So, and then we have a final, um, so all, all of these are in Italian and fairly consistent. 
And then we have a later one, which was produced sometime after Fiore died. And it's written in Latin. It's beautifully colored. Um, I don't actually find it terribly useful, <laughs> but it's very nice to have. Um, and that's in the Bibliothèque Nationale Française. And so it's, it's referred to amongst Fiore people as like the Paris or the BNF um, or the Floridus because it's in, in Latin. So um, there are four, four existing copies of the book. Um, two of them go from wrestling through dagger, through sword, sword in armor, Polax in armor, spear in armor, spear on horseback, sword on horseback, wrestling on horseback. Okay, so they go in that order. Um, that's the Paris and what's called the Pisani Dossi, which is the one that's dated to 10th of February, 1409. Um, we should have a national holiday on the 10th of February. We really should. <laughs> Call it Fury Day. We could all run around with swords. That'd be great. Um, and um, the other two... So the Morgan, which is the incomplete one, which is in the Morgan Library in New York, um, and the Paris, they start with mounted combat and they work towards combat on foot. Okay. So, and what I mean by like, they are a picture of the art, as you can see from the fact that like half of them go from wrestling through to horsey stuff and the other half go, horsey stuff is not a technical term. <laughs> the other half go from um, mounted combat towards wrestling um they're not intended as training manuals they're not uh, they're not designed as okay here is your curriculum do this now you can still do that and people do do that and there's nothing wrong with it but the 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 way that the information is laid out is intended to give you a complete picture of the art rather than give you a training program for the art I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like, may I just make a comparison? Yeah. Okay. Just for our creative practitioners, it's like, guys, uh, a guy is talking about is like what we talk about, Bubishi, this uh, creative manuscript. You know, for today's eyes of creative, this Bubishi is very abstract. It shows some moves and so, but it was also meant exactly the same thing as uh, guys telling for European context and weapon arts. J sorry, I just made this comparison. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay, so um, a lot of what we know about Fiore comes from the introduction to um, the books. And it's, you know, it's, it's better researchers than me have dug around in records in Udine and Aquilaire and places like that um, to find out. But one of the reasons that we are like sure that he, he was who he said he was is the main street in his hometown of Cividale is actually still named after him today. That's, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you can actually walk down the Avenue Fiore de Liberi, which is a pretty cool thing. That's interesting. And, it, and if I remember rightly, there's another Fiore de Liberi street somewhere in Udine. So obviously they liked the work he did for them. Okay, very nice. <laughs> of course, at, at this remove, it's very difficult to say whether he actually knew what he was doing or not, right? Of because course. We, don't, we don't have like a written testimonial from Galeazzo de Mantua saying he was the best sword fighter ever, right? Yeah. Um, but what we do have is all sorts of corroborating data to suggest that he really knew what he was doing and he was highly respected in his own time. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what else do we know about his life? Did he get married? Did he have children? Do we I know? don't know. We I don't, don't know. know these things. Okay. No. So there is not more. Okay. And how many uh, tre treatises or manuscripts did you write? Only one? Well, okay. Again, we can't be certain. We, we are pretty sure that the Getty manuscript, the Morgan manuscript, and the Pisani Dossi manuscript were all written within his lifetime. Okay. Okay. Because they are in his voice and... It was normal back then, if you're making a copy of a book from an author who's died, there's some sort of note to that effect within the book or yeah. something in the book will tell you that, okay, this is a copy of the book made after the author has died. Okay. So that's why we're pretty sure that the, um, the Paris manuscript was created after his death. So it is reasonable to suppose that he signed off on those things. I mean, he says in the introduction that he can read, write and draw. 
So the implication is that, at least for, for example, for the Getty manuscript, that he, he wrote it and drew it himself. I actually find that pretty unlikely because those were, um, now, okay, an awful lot of people could read and write back then, but um, to draw to the level, to, to the technical level that these, his manuscript is drawn to, um, and it's gilded, there are, and one of the really cool innovations he has is, you know, one of the things about any kind of martial arts picture, you've got, you've got two people crossing swords or crossing forearms or whatever, how do you know who's winning? Right. And he has this fantastic visual device, which is um, any given like section has a master whose particular techniques or approach we're looking at. And that master is indicated by a crown. So whoever is wearing the crown is winning. OK. And then that's followed by his scholars. Right. Who wear a garter under the knee. A gold garter. It's done in gold leaf in um, most of the manuscripts. In the Morgan, it's done in silver. But no, beg pardon. Still gold in the Morgan. It's the sword blazer is in silver. I digress. Um, so you can tell in any picture. Okay, that this scholar is continuing the action of the master that came before him, right? And you can tell which one it is by the garter. But then when you see a counter to the scholar or a counter to the master, that person is wearing a crown and a garter, right? So the rule is whoever has the most bling wins, right? <laughs> but the point is you can always tell who is supposed to be doing the thing that's described in the text because each picture has a picture of what's going on and then text above it or below it explaining what's going on in that picture, Yeah. right? Right. And it's it's glorious. It's like it it could not be more straightforward. I mean, it's still taken like I don't know 20 years to figure it all out, but <laughs> still it, it could not be more straightforward who's doing what. And the in the instruction is in apart from the Paris, the instruction is in clear-ish Italian. Um yes, it's it's kind of spelt funny because it's from six hundred years ago and it's it's and it's it's written in, in dialect i mean as as all you know all language is dialect and these days we have a, like a standard form of how how words are spelled which usually comes from whatever dialect the politically dominant people spoke when yeah. when that kind of system was put in place um so you know it it uh, this manuscript predates the kind of the consolidation of Italian into, and, and the kind of the formalization of spelling and what have you. So it, it has some quirks, but it's actually, put it this way, reading it off the page is really hard, right? But when I've read it aloud to an Italian friend of mine, he had no difficulty understanding what, he couldn't read it, but when I read it aloud to him, he had no difficulty understanding what was being said. Interesting. Yeah. So um we are confident that fiore himself was deeply involved in the production of at least the getty manuscript the morgan manuscript and the pisani dossier manuscript yeah copies of all of which of course i have right next to me should you need to see any <laughs> I mean, from linguistic point of view, it's fascinating uh, for me as an English linguist, as uh, you're a native speaker of English, so you, I'm sure you know that. When we look at the development of some languages, let's take English. English, let, if you don't need to go back to 14th century, even from 16th, 17th century to today, you see a tremendous uh, Develop, development, not in a positive sense, change, let's call, change. call yeah. change in English language. In some languages, the, the change is not as much as in English. For example, let's yeah. another language, I know Spanish. Spanish is also different, but it's not that much as in English is the case. Yeah. You see? And that, that's the same with Italian. Italian okay. hasn't changed that much. I mean, but the reason yeah. English has changed that much is because it's a Mongol language. Yeah. It's basically a mixture of um, like the Anglo-Saxon languages being spoken in England yeah. before the French came over or the Normans came over. And the Normans yeah. are actually really Vikings, but they were speaking Norman French. Yes. And so you've got Anglo-Saxon and Norm Norman French yes. kind of 
marrying over, <laughs> yes. the, over the course of a few hundred years, yes. right? Which is why we have so many different words for the same thing. Yes, true. Right? Exactly. And and even even some really like odd things, like for example, we have two different versions of the same word because they come from two different dialects of Norman French. So, yes. for example, guardian and warden. Yeah. are actually the same word really they have slightly different meanings now but they didn't originally yeah. it's just guardian came from um okay one of them came from the kind of the normandy area and some of some of <laughs> william's knights came over from the paris area <laughs> and so they spoke kind of different dialects of norman of of, of 11th century french <laughs> and some of the words in english have come from those two different dialects of French and you can tell them from the spelling it's you know <laughs> you know right? but compared to that compared to that Italian is really straightforward it is one language right you know, it's not a hodgepodge of other languages you know it's the funniest language. thing excuse me <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah the funniest thing is like you know when I teach legal English to some law firms mm -hmm. I work with you know, as you know, that in the past, now they are changing it, the law firms in UK and US. But in the past, for one illegal word, there were three words. One was Latin-based, yeah. one was French-based, and one was English-based. So right. they, they used three plats saying the same thing. So the reason why you want to sound sophisticated, you use Latin. Yes. Then you want to sound cultured, you use French. But average man in UK to understand an English-speaking <laughs> country uses English. So basically used the same same thing three times three plats and now they say guys don't use three plats that's enough just say one word these damned contracts because if you compare british and american contracts to german italian spanish it is always longer i said guys yeah. stop it right you know just one thing i just wanted to it's a funny thing to observe okay go ahead please yeah. i didn't want to go yeah. rest. No, no that's fine um and so so we're lucky that fiori was writing in italian and his Italian is fairly straightforward Italian. I mean, yes, there are some there are some difficulties, some some expressions which are no longer in use, and we've had to kind of like figure out what they might mean. Yeah. Um, but that it's a kind of standard standard bit of like you know, medieval studies. You just have to kind of work with that. Um, so uh, the so okay, the language itself fairly straightforward. The instructions. And this is, this is something where we are extremely lucky when we're trying to recreate this art, right? Fiori's instructions are extremely explicit in many places, not quite as many places as we'd like perhaps, but I mean, he'll say things like, await the peasant's blow in a narrow stance with the left foot forward. And when he comes to strike, cross the swords at the middle and let him his run off to the ground and strike him in the head or thrust him in the chest as you see. Oh, beg pardon. And he says, and, and when he comes to strike, step the front foot out of the way and pass across, meeting the swords in the middle, let his sword run off to the ground and so on. I mean, he even tells you exactly how to step, right? Yeah. Yeah. It couldn't be more straightforward. I mean, people are still arguing about exactly how to do those steps, but everybody knows we're supposed to do something that fits the instruction, step the front foot out of the way and pass across. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's, it's gloriously detailed. And one of the reasons why Fiore has such a broad following is that he covers the whole of knightly combat, right? Wrestling, dagger, sword, including dagger against sword and sword against dagger. That's super fun. Um, sword in armor, parallax in armor, spear in armor. On, this is all on foot. And then mounted combat with spears and swords and wrestling on horseback and then what to do if you're on the ground and you have somebody attacking you on horseback right it is very complete it's very thorough and it is a consistent vision of the art so it's not okay in in many of the sort of contemporaries of 15th century should we say german manuscripts we have here's some cool longsword stuff from this master here's some cool dagger stuff from this master here's some wrestling from this master you know here's some mounted combat from this master and it's it's sort of like a a a hodgepodge of i mean you have all this all the stuff is sort of there but it's not one coherent consistent artistic vision yeah. it is more like a scrapbook yeah 
right? Um, whereas Fiore gives us this coherent thing. So you see the same, the same actions repeated in different places. You see the same instructions repeated in different places. You see the same general kind of approach to fighting from these different angles. So you, you see, okay, this is how I deal with the dagger. Right, okay. Now when I'm dealing with a sword, it's actually pretty similar to what I was doing against the dagger. It's just done with swords instead of with hands. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it's, it's a delight to work with from that perspective. Okay.